Hey everybody, Jeff here. In today's video, we're continuing investigating that Pittsburgh bridge collapse of that Forbes Avenue bridge over there in Frick Park. And so today, what we want to focus on is the possible effects of the weight of the bus. Could that bus have had anything to do with the collapse of that bridge? We're also going to look at other issues such as uh, what made up the bridge. We are also going to check out the Google Maps street view of underneath the bridge, and we're going to examine the different components of it. And we're going to look into reports from the different agencies as to what exactly was it about this bridge that had them concerned enough to give it a poor rating? Why wasn't the bridge shut down? Aren't there any rules to protect us? And why did this happen suddenly on the same day that Biden was in town to talk about infrastructure? Looking at the PAT bus there, this is the articulating bus sitting there on the ground. Before they pulled the bus up and out of the ravine on Monday, they were supposed to go in there and get supposedly nine security cameras worth of video. So I want to know where all of that video is and why haven't they released it yet? I mean, they've had plenty of time to get to it and get it out there right away. So I'm wondering where that is and I'm hoping the NTSB doesn't sit on it. So the Allegheny Crane Company did an absolutely incredible job pulling off a massive engineering feat, getting this bus up out of there with their 400 ton crane. And as you can see right here, there is their crane that they used. And I just thought of a great fundraising effort for us, folks, because take a look at this, folks. What you are looking at is the City of Pittsburgh 2022 official Christmas ornament. What do you think we sell a whole bunch of these things here and use the funds to fix up all the bridges? Yeah, so that was a great idea, huh? So I got this idea because coincidentally on our own Christmas tree, we have the Disney World monorail hanging on ours, as you can see here. So that prompted me to immediately apply that same idea to the bus here. On the previous video, you heard me mention about, you know, the weight limit there and did any of these vehicles surpass that weight limit? So I wanted to look into it with the bus here because I was a little suspicious on how much does this bus weigh because it is a, an articulating bus and, you know, some people call it a tandem bus. Now, we've been told that this 26-ton weight limit sign was changed in 2014. I'm assuming maybe it was more, maybe it was 30 tons or more at some other time in history. So what we do know is that the bridge was derated in 2011, rated poor. Seven years later, Dr. G posts this now famous picture of the damage going on there under the bridge. So in my mind, folks, this bridge is no longer capable of withstanding 26 tons. It should be derated far below that, such that probably most of your heavier vehicles would be disqualified from driving on it. So 16 tons is probably a much more realistic limit of what should have been on that sign. I mean, just look at this. Look at all these gun-free, drug-free signs we put up at the schools. Man, I feel so much safer knowing those are in place. I mean, how, how often do you hear about a school shooting going on and drug deals going on in schools? The Pennsylvania Department of Transportation has this bridge safety inspection manual that they use. And inside this manual, they have a listing of estimates of some of the typical vehicles and, you know, what their weights are. A school bus weighs 12 tons. A charter bus is 16 tons. A fire engine can weigh anywhere from 19 to 30 tons. A snow plow truck can weigh 28 tons, which is already over the limit. An average cement truck can be 33 tons. And an average dump truck can be 36 tons. An average trailer can be 40 tons. Now, do you expect me to believe there's never been a snowplow truck or a dump truck or an, even a cement mixer truck or a fire engine going over this bridge recently? I've got the aggregate total of all these different vehicles that have been violating that weight limit probably contributed over time to the collapse of this bridge since it has already been derated. And I got news for you folks. Most people don't even know the height or weight of their trucks. So, like, for example, check this out here on the 11 foot 8 bridge. I could watch this stuff all day long. I always just watch all of their videos, and, and, and I'm just laughing my butt off at all of these, these trucks here. Here's my favorite here. See, I call this one the Penske Peel. So this is what happens. People don't pay attention to the signs or the warnings or anything, and they just start running into the bridges, and their trucks get torn all apart. So here goes a city bus there, and then right after it, now look at the sign up here. See, it says overweight, must turn. He ignored the warning. So he passed the trigger light that told him he was overweight. 
Yeah, so most people don't even know their own vehicles. Now, just because the sign says 26 tons does not mean that you should attempt fate and take a 26-ton truck over it. I've been telling people for years when I was an engineer at Motorola, warning them about design limits and don't design towards the limits. Limits are something you were supposed to be running away from, not heading toward. Don't go, well, my truck's 25.999 tons, so I'm safe. You know, so I was always telling our engineers that, look, if you're designing a circuit with a tantalum capacitor in it and you need it to run at 10 volts, don't use a 10 volt capacitor like you see here. Instead, bump it up to 15 volts. Don't ever go to the limits. Stay away from the limits. Your mean time between failure rate will be much lower. So was the Pat articulating bus the straw that broke the camel's back? Or was the bridge going to collapse under its own weight anyways from all of the corrosion and the derating? This Forbes Avenue Bridge, which many people also refer to as the Fern Hollow Bridge, is made up of a steel that is called Core 10, and it's short for, think of it as corrosion and tensile strength. So it's supposed to be this metal that forms a patina of rust on its outer skin, as you can see here in these photos of these artwork and the structure here as well. And so what this Core 10 does is it, so it forms this layer of rust much like a scab forms on your skin. Skin, and it's supposed to stop after a while and that's what gives you the protection because of that rusty patina protection you supposedly don't need to paint or seal this kind of steel so why then did this core 10 steel bridge completely rust through like the flesh eating disease the only problem is there's a big achilles heel with this and there's two mortal enemies to this type of steel uh, the first mortal enemy is humidity which you get a lot of here whenever you have a bridge over a ravine like this of course the other mortal enemy of steel is the salt that is put down on the roads and sometimes these salt trucks put down a brine solution which can leak down through whatever nooks and crannies it can find and get all over the support structure so i'm questioning what was their justification for using this type of metal there knowing what its limitations are and then like we showed you here from dr g's photograph from 2018 you can just see how much rust there was here and it almost looks like you've got a, a a seam of separation developing there unless that's a bearing something failed this material failed maybe the too much salt maybe too much humidity but it was definitely failing and if it failed here it's got to have failed everywhere else this is way too much of the rust to be on this type of weathering steel in my opinion so who knows maybe they should have used some other type of steel and maybe there's some type of sealant or paint that could have protected it i don't know why they don't design these with some type of flashing that would protect the bottoms of these anyway there's no reason for these to have to be sitting out there exposed directly to the water falling on it why not just have some type of a flashing system or a shield that that's clogged right there i don't understand what why they did this and there's two things they did wrong if you don't tell water where to go water will make up its own mind and it will be the most expensive path i can guarantee you that what they should have done when this comes down maybe they, they should have ran this pipe down a little bit so that it shoots the water out after you've already passed the concrete base the way it is right now water can keep shooting against this concrete base and i don't know if this is a crack here or what let me see if the other side has any feature like that it doesn't look like it this looks to me like that's cracked now, there was probably a large concrete footing underground to support these. It's probably okay, but that doesn't look good. And, of course, here you can see how rusty that is. Now, here's something predates Dr. G's photo of the famous of this beam when it was sticking out over here you can see the beginnings of the damage here in 2015 that it's already like the flesh eating disease it has already rotted through metal bracket and then coming over here to this side you see more rust dripping down here and it looks like you're, you're seeing more holes in the bracket here and i don't know if there's more here this rough stuff on the edge i can't speak to what that is it might just be the the sun shining through and the blurriness and all that but this is what a patina would normally look like on here for this type of weathering steel but you don't want it to get too much like this here I, I think it's starting to get a little too much and it's starting to eat through itself and look I'm, I'm even seeing it on these brackets here as well and I still don't really know what they were trying to do with this these cables here because if you put a cable here yes it'll keep it from bowing out on both ends like this it can't keep it from bowing inward so I don't know what they thought they were doing with this here 
Here is a Google street map view of the Forbes Avenue bridge from underneath. This was shot in 2020. The quality is, is not very good at all. It almost looks like they used an Apple <laughs> one or something. I don't know. But unfortunately, we don't have a very good clear shot and there's not a lot we can tell. We can sort of look up and see. I don't know if any of that is spalling or if they're just stains or moisture under the railings of the bridge. But there's really not a whole lot of quality information we can get out of this you can see the you can see the concrete bases for the the column superstructure are there and they appear to be intact but really can't tell anything here now here you've got the the x braces are all the way across there and not much we can tell i can't tell if it's missing here or not on this one looks like the brace is missing so that was the one that rusted out okay so now we i want you to take a look at this here's some analysis i was doing by looking at some of the photographs that were taken so jane dudley who lives around the corner had taken this picture of the bridge collapse like moments after it happened and here we're looking towards that gatehouse there right and as you can see this is that concrete pad we just showed you over here from dr g's photograph from 2018 where the column was and looking at her, the photograph she took and this was as close as i could get it to zoom in you could see that the column was completely sheared off of this base pad and you can also see it looks to me like the bolts are still there even so it looks like it's sheared right here at this point now just because it's sheared here does not necessarily mean this is the smoking gun because it could be that it sheared and broke at one of the other columns first there's three other columns and that maybe once the others broke it just caused this one to drag along with it and rip right off so we don't know but certainly looking at the bridge report that i'm about to show you um where, where it listed the four columns were in bad condition um, my money is on one of these columns and this one might as well be one of them so that's why the ntsb is going to be there looking underneath the rubble to see hey did all of these columns just break and shear right off did they crack up here or did they buckle and then did the bridge maybe just kind of lower itself with a softer landing than a full-born collapse also remember that the metal can sometimes get brittle when it's cold and so we remember that's what they were saying happened on the titanic that when it hit the iceberg that it actually shattered holes into the bottom of the hull because there was mistakes made in the metal and it wasn't as strong as they thought it was hey i have a question where did all that money go that was supposed to fix the bridges what happened to it well i bet if we brought in some real good forensic accountants we would probably find some criminal activity along the way but anyway the pennsylvania auditor general here he said back in 2019 that the audit finds that 4.2 billion that's with a b folks was diverted from repairing roads and bridges and this funding would have helped eliminate probably 2800 bridges from that list and then when you come down here and look at this and let's zoom into it these are the structurally deficient bridges in pennsylvania and how about that folks huh pennsylvania is a red state after all who knew here is basically where most of it went right here it says it was supposed to come from that motor license fund but it went to the state police in a total more than 4.2 billion since 2012 so this has been going on for a number of years and you know i'm all for funding the police but i'm like hey don't they have their own budget what happened to their budget why are they stealing the money from here why are we robbing peter to pay paul and so something's got to be done here it, it seems like maybe budgets have gotten out of control and they got caught with what do we do where do we get the money from so th this is not good to do that and especially where pennsylvania you guys up there in pennsylvania if you live up there you already have a massively huge gas tax like the third in the country or something like that you're in the top three for sure and look at this as a whopping 50 this was in 29 57 cents per gallon is your tax there so that's just unbelievable so how do we solve this problem of misappropriation of funds and how do we address the politicians not doing what they claimed they were going to do with all of these funds that they're collecting from us otherwise why do they need to charge that high of a tax so really the way you solve something like this folks is there's no federal regulations against it and they really should be the reason why you don't have compliance is because it's not tied to their freedom from jail and it's not tied to their paycheck as soon as you tie this to their paycheck to their money to their job and as soon as you tie this to their freedom and not being charged criminally and thrown into jail you will find you're going to get some pretty good compliance i would think 
this is the reason why this stuff keeps going on, because there's no accountability for it. Nobody gets in trouble. Nobody gets fired. Nobody gets thrown in jail. Some of these white collar criminals should be sitting in jail alongside all of the other criminals. What really blows my mind here, folks, is that the homeowners association where I live will get all over me if my paint starts fading, if the roof gets too dirty, if I get oil stains on my driveway. I get a letter and I have to get rid of that right away. But a bridge can be in poor condition for a decade and no warning or no shutdown or nothing. It's just kept in a database. Nobody knows there's anything wrong with the bridge until the bridge collapses and then we go look it up in the database to see what was wrong. Yeah, so when we pull up this info on the bridge, we can see here on the climate graph that I was very shocked to find out that the humidity percentage here, the average relative humidity is about 80%. And I was quite surprised. I mean, I know it's over a ravine where, you know, water drains when it rains and lands at the bottom of the bridge, but, um, and then you have the creek next to it. But uh, hey, if those of you who've ever gone walking on the trail by it, maybe you'll know Notice that it gets a little humid when you walk under the bridge. Let us know. But um, compared to South Florida, where I'm at, when you get over 50% humidity, that's when you start to feel the humidity. By 60%, you're already getting uncomfortable, and you want to go inside for air conditioning. And by 80%, it's you know it's just off the charts basically knowing that there was that humidity there i don't know why they planted that bridge there now if you go look in the uh, national bridge inventory information one thing that's interesting here is it tracks the condition of the three major elements so the blue is the deck condition and it started out okay back in looks like 1987 and it degraded over the years see so it's now down at poor level at four and then the orange is the superstructure and i guess it went up and maybe they did some repairs earlier on and then it came back down again and it's currently at four which is poor and then the substructure is actually in much better condition, likely because they're referring to the concrete down below and underground. Um, that's what I would think this is. Now, if we look at the national bridge elements, I want to see here's where we almost get a pretty quantitative view of what it was they found. So they looked at the reinforcement deck. Most of it was at CS1, which you, you could say is good. 3% of it was at fair. 36% of it was in poor shape. So they're probably finding a lot of spalling and plus all of that chips and stuff that we saw on the curb that we showed you. Now look at the steel girder beams here. There's 885 of these in the superstructure. 69% are good, 14% are fair, and 15% are poor, as it says there. And the stringers, um, though those run the whole length of the bridge underneath the slabs. Um, these here, they were in actually reasonably good shape. Only you have 95% were in good shape, and only 4% were in poor condition. The steel floor beams, these are the ones that go across the bridge underneath all of the concrete slabs. There, those are 94%. Same thing, they're in fairly good shape. And the reason is, is for the most part, they're sort of protected from the elements by the slab. But if you look down on the substructure, look at the steel columns. It says there's four columns here, right? And all four of these columns, 100% of their columns, this should be the big red flag right here. I'm going to highlight this because all four of these columns are at severe right there, state severe. So at that point, I mean, I'm, I w I'm thinking, hey, you know, you shut down the, the bridge and, and you do some repairs. And then the masonry abutments, these are on either end of the bridge. They're pretty much in good shape. And then the bearings, too. So here you got these movable roller bearings, right? And it's 50-50. Two of them are in fair condition here, and the other two are in bad condition condition see it says poor condition so that's not a good thing either so my money on this failure is going to be on these steel columns i think they either buckled or they cracked well i hope you're enjoying this series so far and if you are hey you know what to do folks give us a thumbs up down below that tells us that you like us hey but you know what if you didn't like the video then hit that thumbs down button twice show that jeff guy who's boss and if you're not subscribed to this channel, man, hey, no, all you got to do is just check out some of these other engineering disaster videos here and binge watch some of them. So thank you so much for joining us this time, folks, and we'll see you on the next one.